Welcome to the We Move Adolescent Health webinar hosted by the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation and IAVI. My name is Heather Lehodi. I am the head of department and senior lecturer at the Department of Human Nutrition at the University of Pretoria, and I will be chairing this session. So I really look forward to working with you. And if you are from Tembisa, I'm from Tembisa in the East Rand in South Africa. So if you are from anywhere in that area, a shout out to you. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to an interesting and interactive session. And on behalf of the Desmond Tutu Foundation, I would like to acknowledge our main sponsor, which is the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, IAVI, for your support. This is the first webinar in the We Move To series. And today we're going to be focusing on non-communicable diseases, looking into overweight, obesity, diabetes, mainly of course among adolescents. We will hear talks from Professor Mary Baker, Professor Nashita Pierre, and Dr. Theodosia Edon in between which we will have an artistic interlude from Danki Somamabolo. So we look forward to a great day. So this will be followed by a panel discussion where our speakers will be joined by our panelists. And that will be Ms. Monica Kankuema Sakarias and Pritha Mistry for the discussion later on. So the topics that will be addressed today are engaging adolescents in ways of improving their health and well-being and the risk factors contributing to cardiometabolic diseases in adolescents. But to start us off, we would like to know a little bit more about what you think. And we have a quick poll question. So please be on the lookout for that one. Look out for it. Um, it will appear on your screen now, and please complete by clicking your preferred response to the question. So as you see it um, flighted, is, the question says, obesity is likely to be a, a common among adolescents who, and please click on one of those um, answers. Oh, okay. So 61% say obesity is likely to be common among adolescents who have access to high processed foods. And then 28% is those who lead a sedentary lifestyle and 11% for genetically predisposed, those who are genetically predisposed to obesity. So that's interesting, interesting answers. And hopefully we will get more information from our speakers. So just to introduce the first speaker, Professor Mary Baker, who is a professor of psychology and behavioral science at the University of Southampton in the UK. And she also co-leads the behavioral science theme for the NIHR Southampton Biomedical Research Center. She runs a program of work in both the UK and in low income countries. This program aims, aims to engage young people in improving their sense of agency, agency, well-being, and mental health to benefit their health in general, but more specifically, their diets and physical activity habits. She is an adjunct professor at the University of Agde, Norway, and has an honorary appointment at the University of Vatersrand, which is my alma mater in South Africa and the University College London. And the title of her talk is Engaging Adolescents in Ways of Improving Their Health and Wellbeing. Over to you, Professor Baka. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk this afternoon in your webinar on adolescent health and NCD risks. So I want to talk briefly today about why adolescents and why we might work with them, some of the challenges and opportunities that we have in working with adolescents to improve health and well-being and reduce NCD risk, and then some of the ideas that we have had about ways that we might most effectively reduce uh, their long-term risk of, uh, of NCDs by engaging with them. 
So first of all, why work with adolescents? Well, uh, we know, of course, that adolescence is, we now know that adolescence is a key developmental phase uh, in life and that things that change in adolescence can affect uh, long-term health and long-term risk of NCDs uh, for that young person. So the flip side being that the physiological and brain changes and behavioural changes in adolescents, uh, if we can uh, engage with those young people to change those to a more beneficial trajectory, then we know that we could improve uh, risk and reduce risk and improve health and well-being for the long term, not just for the young person themselves now, for the young person themselves in the future, but also for the for the benefit of you know, uh, offspring born to that young person, should they choose to have them. So what do we know about risk factors and health behaviour in young people around the world? Well, this sh slide shows the data from a pooled analysis of qualitative interviews and focus groups with young people and with uh, caregivers and other key informants uh, in eight countries around the world. And we published this analysis in The Lancet last year in the Adolescent Nutrition Series. And what we tried to do was to group up the responses of the young people and the caregivers to our questions about things that were important in determining their food choice. We grouped them into, into uh, those which were relevant to different types of food environment where the young people were living. So food environment is really just a descriptor of the kinds of ways of, of, that food is produced, distributed and sold in different types of setting uh, and the more modern food environments where access to food is primarily through suppliers like supermarkets is a more urban phenomenon and of course uh, the flip side is that the more traditional food environment describes a setting where food is produced uh, uh, more traditionally produced and farmed and uh, your access to food is, is via um, uh, the food that you produce yourself or more likely to be that way. So you can see from the slide that the four key factors that young people talked about in terms of determining their food choices were the, the desirability of the food, the convenience, the affordability and the availability. And you can also see that depending on which kind of food environment these young people were living in, these factors weighted very differently. So for, for young people in a traditional food environment, availability and affordability were key in determining what they were able to eat. By contrast, for young people in a modern food environment, one where uh, supermarkets were the main suppliers of food and, uh, uh, and, and there was clearly more choice and more access to food, then desirability and convenience were much more important factors. And for the mixed food environment, there was a kind of a spread of factors. And the bubbles above each of these boxes illustrate the kinds of things that the young people in each setting told us about the factors that affected what they were able to eat. So you can see from this that there are clear differences in access to food and choices about food depending on the kind of setting that these young people are living in as well as the kinds of things that they actually prefer to eat. So clearly it's not all about individual behaviour, it's also clearly about the setting and the context in which people are making these choices. Talent, uh, Transforming Adolescent Lives Through Nutrition was one of the studies uh, that contributed data to that pooled analysis. And this was, uh, we produced data through a large collaboration with um, countries, uh, sorry, adolescent researchers in settings and countries around Africa and India. And we asked not just about food in these conversations, we also asked about physical activity and the factors that affected their physical activity. And we found many things through these conversations. We had several hundred conversations with young people and caregivers. And we found that it wasn't that young people didn't so much know what they were able to, what they should and be eating um, and that they should be active. It was much more that there were other things which tended to get in the way, um, other things that were more of a priority for them. Um, and that there were important things to do with the transitioning nature of the societies that they were living in, which also affected their ability to be physically active and to eat healthily. Parenting was a very big issue. We heard a lot about, we heard about conflict around food and food choices. We also heard a lot about gender and the uh, difficulties that some young women in some of these settings had uh, um, in going out and being physically active in the way that boys were much more able to be. So the implications of this uh, of this um, analysis really are that we have to understand the societal and economic 
setting that the young people are behaving and acting in in order to be able to support them to make uh, more healthy food choices and also to be more active. It's not enough simply to ask what young people like to eat and and want to eat. It's it's much more about and what they how they want to be active and where they want to be active. It's much more about the uh, facility and the capability in the setting for them to do those things. So that was an important finding and we have a huge amount of data which describes those features in young people around the world. So what are the challenges, the other challenges to engaging with young people? Well, one of them is that their diets tend to be pretty terrible. Where they have any choice in the matter, they will tend to choose sh high sugary, high fat foods, not a lot of fruit and vegetables. They will be relatively inactive and even in settings where young people are forced to be active by the fact that there is no transport and that they have to walk places, we have found that the large majority of that activity is very low impact and very little of it is is a, a moderate or, vis or vigorous activity. And then of course on top of all of that adolescents are famously difficult to engage in thinking about their health because being young people they're relatively healthy and they don't tend to take a long-term view of these things because other things in their immediate lives are more important. So what do we do with all of this? Well one of the things that we have done is to think very hard about what adolescent values, uh, uh, how they engage, what matters to adolescents and how this engages how this interacts with their ability to change their behaviour. And this little uh, infographic is really a breakdown of, of what young people, what's important to young people in terms of the conversations that we've been having with them about food and physical activity. So as I said, they tend to know what it means. They know what healthy means. They know that it's important to them. It's not, they don't behave in ways that are unhealthy because they don't know what they should be doing often. There are things like the other young people in their lives or the other people in there, the other key important adults in their lives which make have impact on their choices. They also want to be independent from the adolescent supervision uh, that they, uh, sorry, the adult supervision which they're often subjected to. They want to have their own lives, they want to grow in independence. But ultimately to be healthy has to fit into the rest of their lives and the rest of the things that they care about in their lives. It has to be, they have to have uh, the ability to accommodate being healthy within the things that are already important to them. And this again is a is a, a boiled down analysis, if you like, a representation of a much larger analysis of, of several key data sets that we have generated from young people in different settings. And it seems to underpin pretty much whatever activity you're talking about in terms of food choice and physical activity choice from young people wherever they are in the world. So we know from this analysis that adolescents really value being with their friends it's very so so it's very important for them to be social and to be with friends and to connect with friends it's very important for their uh, psychological physiological and uh, health and their development to, to to do that they also it's also important for them to be competent to be good at things to be seen to be good at things for their growth and for their growth in confidence and they uh, also have a need to be respected and seen as individuals and as individual people uh, and um, uh, to have sort of autonomy around their own independence and choices. And what we identified through all our analysis is that these values that young people tell us about overlap significantly with the uh, three basic psychological needs outlined by self-determination theory, that's autonomy, competence and relatedness. So basically everything we have gone on and done with young people since then really try to build this sense of autonomy in young people, give them a sense of competence, ability to do things, capability to do, uh, for, do for doing things that, that they want to do, and to be sociable, to be related to other people. And those, these three values underpin all our intervention activities. The other thing that, independs, that really underpins our intervention activities is this idea that in order to promote positive behaviour change, you really need to engage with the positive. Rather than telling people what they shouldn't be doing, it seems to be much more effective to engage with people around things that they can do and want to do. And this schematic shows uh, something that has been referred to as the upward spiral uh, theory of health behaviour change. So that if you do something uh, that it, it positively impacts your health behaviour, you feel better, you engage your non-conscious emotions and motives for health behaviours, it makes you feel generally good, you're therefore more likely to engage in those health behaviours, uh, those healthy health behaviours and activities, which in turn then builds your psychological and physiological resources, again then uh, making you more likely to engage in those uh, 
positive health behaviours. So it's a spot an upward spiral. And again, this is very important to us in all the intervention work that we have been doing. So what have we been doing? Well, the one programme I would like to tell you about is something that we call Each B, which is short for Engaging Adolescents in Changing Behaviour. And this programme is a five year programme of work to develop interventions to support young people eat better and be more active. And it's funded in the UK by the National Institute for Health and Social Care Research. Um, and uh, we have developed um, an intervention based primarily on engagement with something called Life Lab. So in, the, in Southampton, in the hospital where I work, we have a big facility for young people to come in and experience what it's like to do science and uh, to be part of a kind of hospital setting. And it's very hands on and very engaging. And as part of that experience, young people are encouraged to think about what uh, they can do now to improve their health, but also what their health long term will mean to them and what it will mean to them as future parents. And one of the things that young people do when they're in the life lab uh, experience with us is they make a commitment to changing something and as the graph on the on the left of the slides shows that many of those commitments they make are to changing diet and exercise habits and to some extent sleep. So building on this we have taken Life Lab as one intervention component and we have we have added to that training for teachers uh, for young people in schools to support healthy behaviour change. We train them in something called health, healthy conversation skills. And on top of that, we have worked as a third component for the intervention. We have worked with young people over the last few years to develop a smartphone app, which is essentially um, an app with game features. So it's a fun, engaging, positive emotional experience, as I was referring to earlier. So we are trying, as I said, to build their autonomy as young people, as scientists if you like making uh, investigations and and making their own and controlling their own findings and their own research we have given them a um, tried to give them space to build their own capacity and their own competence in being healthy and exercising their own choices and we have supported them with uh, a sort of sociable relatedness um, smartphone app which is also about engaging that positive upward spiral of emotions and we're trialing this in a huge trial at the moment which is, has got another year and a half to run so I can't tell you how effective we've been in changing diet and physical activity for a little while I'm afraid. This very complicated slide <clears throat> really shows uh, how we have tried very hard to think the, through the logic of what we are doing in each B and how it builds on the things that we know are important to adolescents, the values that adolescents have, uh, and the components of the, particularly this is this slide illustrates the components of the smartphone app, the gamified smartphone app, the positive fun thing that we get them to do, that we offer them to do um, in improving their diets and physical activities. And the logic in the yellow, the thread in the, that is, is uh, illustrated in the yellow boxes shows how we track from the adolescent value of really health not being as important to them as other things are, um, we design something that uh, intervention that harnesses and relies on these values to make dietary change more more possible. Uh, we build in healthy conversation support, we build in behaviour change techniques, we base the whole thing on theory and one element of the smartphone game is a, is a the smartphone app, sorry, is a game which challenges young people to think about, to record and think about their exposure to media manipulation in relation to food marketing. So essentially food adverts. So young people engage with this, they collect data for themselves, they think critically about their food choices and the long term, in, the long -term outcome we uh, anticipate or hope for is that they will then become more thoughtful, more reflective about the influences on their food choices externally and are more resilient towards what is clearly an obesogenic environment that's pushing towards pushing them towards high processed, high fat, high sugar foods all the time. So that's really just an illustration of how we have used the things that we know about young people and the, the things that they have told us to uh, harness really their values uh, in designing an intervention that we hope will work for them. Uh, these are some of this slide illustrates some of the fun things that we do with young people. Um, it's uh, we have game jams, we have photographic competitions, we have um, poetry competitions. They're offered support in all kinds of online ways. They play games which kind of match three games and it's all intended to, to promote this upward spiral, as I said to you, of, of positive emotions. And what we have found and are exploring to a great extent at the moment in our interventions with adolescents is art and art and uh, photography, particularly in filmmaking is another and gaming 
as, as ways of engaging that positive emotion, because we know emotions are so important. Um, if I had time, I would show you the trailer, but I'm afraid I'm, I have to move on. So what do we think uh, would make adolescent interventions with adolescents really work to improve their long term health? Uh, and their, in, in the short instance, their diets and physical activities. We think they need to address issues that are relevant to, to adolescents. We need to, to address those values which we talked about, those basic needs, their need for autonomy, their need for competence and relatedness. And we need, we believe, to engage their emotions as well as their thinking and reflective capabilities. We need to make them feel good about what they're doing to make them have some fun. And what do we need to do to make sure when we're designing our interventions that this happens? Well, the most important thing that I can say is that we need to uh, ensure sufficient time for careful planning and formative work. We need to offer interventions which are very focused on the person, which, which really address those needs, those values that adolescents have, and which take into account where adolescents are at in their lives. And as I've suggested, we believe we need to add art and creative processes that generate feelings as well as cognitions, positive feelings largely. So that really is what I'd like to say today. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm very grateful to all our, my colleagues and our funders and to so many young people who have given us so many genius ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Baka. Um, and one thing I picked up from there, I don't want to go much into just summarizing what you've said, but the important role that the setting plays and that the context plays as to whether it is in a rural or a, a, an urban setting. Thank you very much. So at the moment, what we'll do, we're going to into that interlude. If I can just introduce our artist. Danki So Mama Bolo is a Cape Town based songwriter, singer and poet whose work focuses on marginalized young people. She will be sharing a song that she says comes from a place of self-love. And as Professor has mentioned, that it is important, that autonomy with our young people. And I think this will connect, um, will connect to that. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Danki Somama Bolo and I'm a Cape Town based musician, singer, songwriter, actor and director. My work uh, highlights issues facing marginalized people like women, black people and children. And in today's song, I chose to speak from a place of love because a lot of the time when young people face issues that manifest physically, we are quick to judge them and tell them to fix it um, when we should really be teaching them that the only way to keep a healthy body is to love your body and treat it like you appreciate it. And so the song is to give them confidence and to hopefully remind them that they own their bodies. I hope you enjoy it. Believe me when I say you're perfect as you are. Believe me when I say, darling, you don't have to work for it. Believe me when I say, you're perfect as you are. Believe me when I say, darling, you don't have to work for it. You're in love for you, darling, don't you see? This is all you've got. Love yourself every second, even when it's really tough. One step at a time brings you closer to you. From a step to a run, you've got nothing to prove. Take it from me, love. You're perfect as you are. Take it from me, please, darling. You don't have to work for it. Take it from me, love. You're perfect as you are 
Take it from me, please, darling. You don't have to work for it. Don't listen to what they say. Love your body anyway. Do exactly what you need to make your spirit feel complete. Every shape and every size matters more than what their eyes see whenever they see you. They don't know what you've been through. 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 Believe me when I say you're perfect as you are. Believe me when I say, darling, you don't have to work for it. Believe me when I say you're perfect as you are. Believe me when I say, darling, you don't have to work for it. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Wow, wow. Thank you very much, thank you. So that was beautiful. That self-love is so important. And I'm glad as Prof was speaking that she is a specialist in psychology. I am in nutrition. And it just shows you the importance of that multidisciplinary approach when we talk of obesity and, and um, the dietary practices of young people. So thank you for that one. Self-efficacy is very important. If I can just, let's go to our next speaker, but I hope that just added a little bit of butter to, to our day for today. So our next speaker is Associate Professor Nashita Pierre. She's a physician by training and a senior specialist scientist in the Non-Communicable Diseases Research Unit at the South African Medical Research Council. Her interest in cardiometabolic and cardiovascular diseases, epidemiology, and health systems research. Over to you, Professor Nashita. Good afternoon. My talk is on the risk factors contributing to cardiometabolic diseases in adolescents. Over the past century, development related to globalization and urbanization, among other influences, have changed the landscape. There is evident worldwide, including in Africa, where there have been revolutions in transportation, communication, workplace and domestic related technologies. This has widely impacted on behavior and lifestyles, particularly on diet and physical activity patterns. As a result of these behavioral changes, adolescents have become less active and now lead more sedentary lives. For example, before adolescents were more likely to walk to schools, etc., but now with easier access to public transport, particularly in urban centers, they are less likely to walk great distances. Previously also, adolescents were more likely to pay, play soccer or cricket whereas now they play computer games and watch television instead, which further contributes to lower activity levels. Additionally, in South Africa, environmental factors that deter teenagers from being physically active include a lack of safe spaces, high crime rates, and a lack of basic infrastructure for exercising. Consequently, physical activity, based on the Global Physical Activity Questionnaire, and determined as less than 600 mets per week was high in young South Africans aged 15 to 24 years. Overall, 47% or, or almost half of females and 31% or almost a third of males were inactive. As shown in this figure, physical inactivity was higher in urban compared to rural areas for both males and females. Physical activity levels are reported to peak in mid 
adolescents and then decline in adults. The challenge, therefore, is not only to promote physical activity among adolescents, but to ensure its sustainability in adulthood. So why should we be concerned about the need to be physically active? This is because insufficient physical activity increases the risk of many adverse health conditions, including diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases. Insufficient physical activity is one of the 10 leading risk factors contributing to global mortality. The other important shift in lifestyle behaviors has been the uptake of unhealthy diets. In South Africa and other countries, there has been a nutrition transition with changes in eating patterns away from traditional foods to processed foods and more refined carbohydrates that are calorie dense and high in fats and salts. This is reflected in the findings of the 2016 DHS, where the regular intake of unhealthy foods was common in 15 to 19 year old South Africans. 42% of teenagers had drank sugar sweetened beverages the previous day. About a third or more ate fried foods, salty snacks or processed meal, meats at least once a week, with an additional 15 to 32% of teenagers consuming these daily. Furthermore, as highlighted by the rates in bold, adolescents were more likely to consume fried foods, salty snacks and processed meats daily than the general South African population. The key contributor to overweight and obesity in adolescents, similar to that in adults, is the emergence of the obesity, obesogenic environment just described. The alterations in adolescents' dietary and physical activity patterns with the consumption of calorie-dense foods, decreases in physical activity, and increases in sedentary behaviors has led to an energy imbalance with more calories consumed than expended and the development of overweight and obesity. This is reflected in 15 to 19 year old South African girls whose mean body mass index of 24 kilograms per meter squared closely approximated the overweight cut point of 25. At 27%, over a quarter of girls were overweight or obese. Mean BMI and overweight and obesity levels were lower in 15 to 19 year old boys compared with girls. Nevertheless, almost one in 10 boys were overweight or obese. The pattern in men and women reflects that of adolescents with much higher rates in women at 68% versus 31% in men. This illustrates that once overweight and obesity develops in adolescents, it is unlikely to decrease without active intervention and behavioral modification. When examining the trends over three time points, mean BMI increased in 15 to 24 year old females over an 18 year period while remaining stable in young males. Similarly, the prevalence of overweight and obesity increased markedly in young females while remaining stable in young males. These findings point to a continuing high rates of rising levels of overweight and obesity in young South Africans. Obesity is of concern because of its well-established link with multiple poor outcomes as shown on the slide. It is among the leading risk factors for global mortality and life expectancies may be shortened by four to 10 years. Among 15 to 24 year old South Africans, obesity and unhealthy lifestyle behaviors have contributed to the one to 2% prevalence of diabetes and 17 to 20% prevalence of hypertension. Obesity also has many other negative physical and mental health consequences in adolescents. These can include psychological effects such as low self-confidence, low self-esteem, negative impacts on school performance, social rejection, substance abuse, etc. Therefore, it is important to prevent the development of obesity in adolescents. These are some recommended lifestyle changes to reduce energy intake by changing eating behaviors. 
and these recommendations relate to increased energy expenditure by making a concerted effort to be more physically active, including in daily activities. I'll touch briefly on diabetes because obesity is a key risk factor for its development, together with a complex gene environment interaction of non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors, such as sedentary behaviors, physical inactivity, and calorie-dense diet, which we've seen are common in young South Africans. Diabetes is of concern because it is a well-recognized cause of premature death and disability, leading to the complications shown on the slide. Therefore, in summary, it is important to prevent the development of diabetes from the outset by targeting the risk factors of physical inactivity, poor diets and obesity, particularly in adolescent South Africans. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I, I thought, should I speak as a nutrition specialist or should I speak as a mother? But I'll just speak for now as a mom who has a daughter who is 20. And in line with what uh, Prof. Baka said, that that autonomy is important. It is important that the young people take up health as something that is important to them. Because it's one thing how you bring up children in terms of what it is that they need to do and what they need to eat and physical activity. But it is important to also have them choose that lifestyle. And sometimes it takes quite a bit of time. I'm in a space where now my daughter has taken up physical activity as much as I've been modeling it and eating healthy. So yeah, just to say to us as specialists in the area that it takes a bit of time, but definitely that thing about autonomy is important. If I can just mention to our attendees that we will have an opportunity to ask questions or make comments at the end of presentations. So if you can just hold off and make, make a note of the questions that you would like to, to ask our presenters. Thank you very much to Prof. Pierre. Our next presenter is Dr. Theodosia Adom. With, who is a research uh, scientist with the Ghana Commission. Her research interests include maternal, infant, and child nutrition and health, childhood obesity, body composition assessment, using stable isotopes, monitoring and evaluation of nutrition intervention programs. That's definitely a mouthful. So she will be presenting on risk factors contributing to cardiometabolic diseases in adolescents. Over to you, Prof. Good afternoon. My name is Theodosia Adon, and I'm presenting on prevention of common cardiometabolic disease risk factors in adolescents. Now, why adolescents? The WHO recognizes that childhood obesity is a priority, it's a major risk factor for adults, obesity, and uh, cardiometabolic diseases in adulthood. And secondly, because they are responsive to environmental changes. Now, there are global, regional, and national responses. So, for effective intervention, we need to recognize that the problem is beyond the individual. Now, many research interventions targeting behavioral changes in, uh, in children in childhood have not yielded expected outcome. Um, and this calls for, th this has been attributed to maybe the short duration or the design of the interventions. Looking at this, there are calls for increased advocacy to look beyond the individual and look at the environment, what can be done. And we all agree that uh, without a supporting and a supportive environment, behavioral changes may be um, modest or, yeah, behavioral changes may be modest. Now, it will be true in the global 2013, 2020, 2020 action plan for the prevention and control of NCDs. 
recognize the importance of the environment. And then they do the objective three of this action plan is on reducing modifiable risk factors for NCDs and underlying social determinants through creation of health promoting environments. Now there are proposed population based policy actions and plans to reduce unhealthy diets, reduce physical inactivity, reduce tobacco use, and reduce harmful use of alcohol. These are the four major risk factors for the development of non communicable diseases, cardiometabolic diseases. Now, proposed environment, proposed um, strategies to influence the food environment. Some are regulating the marketing of unhealthy foods and non alcoholic beverages, mainly through restricting television advertising and sponsorship, then food labeling, food and nutrition labeling. And this is important because the consumer is provided with adequate information at the point of purchase. So they, they know what to do. They know the health implications of whatever they are getting themselves in, in, involved in. Then there are food taxes and subsidies. Example is a sugar tax and then fruits and vegetable initiatives where um, we are, we are looking at making fruits and vegetables available and accessible through production and distribution. Now these um, strategies have been shown to decrease the intake of foods high in energy, salt, sugar, and total fats. On the physical activity environment, there are calls for sector collaborations to create a safe and living environment. Now, people may want to engage in active work, active transport, for instance, but then if the environment is, is not safe, so you have crime, high violence, and all that, they are not, these are disincentives to them engaging in public and active transport, sorry. And then there's also the provision of adequate and appropriate facilities for active transport and active, active play. On tobacco use and harmful use of alcohol, they are, they are, they are, these are the strategies to increase taxes and prices on tobacco products and alcohol to provide the consumer with adequate information and health warnings, particularly in tobacco use. There, 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 there is a large, there are large and um, graphic and uh, plain labeling to inform the consumer at the point of purchase that this is what you are getting yourself into. Tobacco use can cause blindness can cause death and, and all that. Then community-based intervention, the school, the home, the, and then other community settings. At the school level, there is an um, introduction or integration of the concept of healthy diet and physical activity, general healthy behaviors in the classroom curriculum, then provision of healthy school meals, and also ensuring that schools and um, drinks that are sold around the schools are healthy, providing more access to drinking water and adequate staffing and adequate and appropriate staffing. And this is important, especially in, in quality P in the school curriculum and also in the integration of the healthy lifestyle in the curriculum. The home um, initiatives, home-based initiatives include the promotion of vegetable gardens. So the, the, the children, they are both family members, including our adolescents, they have these readily available and they also promote healthy lifestyle. So the, the parents or other family members are serving as role models and the, the whole family is engaging in healthy behavior. Other community settings, we're looking at providing a safe working paths cycling, and like I stated earlier, and public transport, upgrade of open spaces for active play. Now, social marketing strategies, or health promotion to social marketing campaigns are, are important, they are crucial in changing the social, cultural norms, beliefs, and attitudes, and perceptions of, of individuals of the, of the population on healthy behaviors. For instance, for, in some cultures, girls may not be allowed to girls may not be allowed to engage in outdoor activities. But then when the family, when the culture, when the family, the whole family is, in, is um, educated, they know the importance of physical activity. So they may then be allowed. Now, evidence from Africa. In Africa, there's limited evidence. And um, a couple of years ago, we did some work looking at school-based interventions to address 
uh, uh, diet and physical activity behavior as, as well as overweight and obesity, which are risk factors for NCDs and cardiometabolic risks. Now, what we found was that in Africa, there were not many, many studies, no, no much studies have been done. We came up with only 10 studies, and these 10 studies were from two countries, only two of the 54 African countries. The results were inconsistent. They were, the studies were poor, mainly of uh, poor to moderate quality, methodological quality, and the duration also, short duration. Then policy actions also, we have these policies and actions in Africa, policies and actions on based on the global recommendations and the initiatives on and providing healthy environments. But the research on this, the research on the policies and actions that have been beautifully crafted are from, from high income countries, that's other contexts. Then many countries in Africa do not have food-based dietary guidelines and national PA plans and health. These are, these are crucial in, 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 implementing, in implementing the programs, the strategies, and the plans. Without the implementation becomes an issue. And so, so then it's not surprising that there's inadequate policy implementation. So the policies are there. We know what to do. We know what works. But then and the implementation is a challenge. But it's not all that gloomy. And, and, and a positive highlight is the sugar sweetened baby tax, also known as the health promotion levy, which was introduced in South Africa in 2018. Now, this levy, we do not have the evidence on its impact on health and NCDs per se. But the available evidence from observational studies show that this strategy has led to product reformulation. Also, the prices of beverages have, it has affected the price of beverages and then purchases mainly by low income families. And then there is the Africa Food Environment Research Network. And they are looking at the general food systems, not just in relation to um, or, or, or healthy diet and the general uh, food environment. And they are also, their, their programs are also responsive to the WHO best advice for NCD prevention, marketing to children restrictions, and improving school nutrition policies and environments. Now, what's the way forward? We agree that, it's, yes, it's important to provide a health promoting environment at the multiple sectors that is through the home and the community for the adolescent to embark on or to adopt healthy behaviors. But then we know that there's limited evidence. So we are, we are, I'm proposing that and stakeholder, more stakeholder engagement and collaboration. And this, this comes out tops when you look at the uh, implementation of the sugar sweetened beverage in South Africa, because the food industry, they were actively involved. Yes, they were, and if they were delays, but then eventually they came along and then this was introduced and the effect, the, the, the impact is there for all to see. Then because there are no guidelines and standards, food, food dietary based, food based dietary guidelines and, and standards and also physical activity plan and health. These are crucial for implementing the policies that we have. We have the, the policies are there. When you look at Africa, they, they, are, they we have the policy that well intended, but then there are no guidelines that are not there. There are no guidelines or they are the guidelines and there are only a few countries have guidelines and, and standards to you know implement. And then it is an, it's an issue. So the way forward, we need to get more guidelines and standards. Now funding, funding for implementation, funding is, is also important. For example, when you look at the introduction of the concept of healthy and diet and physical activity in the school curricula, we need to train professional, more professionals to be able to implement this, this strategy. The monitoring, monitoring, we are looking at encouraging and strengthening school health and wellness committees, and also BMI monitoring. BMI is a body mass index. This is, is a, is a uh, less costly but effective strategy to identify adolescents who are at risk of developing um, cardiometabolic diseases. And once you identify them early, 
you are then able to you are provided with that window of opportunity to intervene. So you stop it from developing into you know, and cardio metabolic disease. Then you also look at the key foods, school food and PA environment to, to monitor to ensure that um, the guidelines or what the standards are being adhered to. And finally, to evaluate existing intervention for adolescents. The evidence shows that there isn't much work done in um, adolescent intervention for adolescents. So if there are works on, on ongoing activities, ongoing research, we may want to evaluate them to see how, how they are uh, answering our uh, objectives and then modify it when necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Theo. Thank you so much. Um, as you mentioned, that when we talk of um, sugary beverages, the challenge that we are experiencing in South Africa is we also have these unregulated um, sweetened beverages that come into the country. So as much as maybe the sale of, for example, your Cokes, your Fantas, those that are regulated maybe goes down. There's different varieties that are introduced, but also on the other hand, there's these other ones that are not regulated that, that are brought into the country. But we acknowledge what you were saying. One of the things is that we need to evaluate the different interventions. Some of them maybe we're still at, the, at that early stage, like the, the sugar tax, that also it is important to create a health promoting environment. But if I can just mention some of the text or comments that are in our text boxes, um, I see from Zugi Swa on the interlude that was presented saying that it was beautiful, Jackie, that it was lovely and very meaningful lyrics. I, I definitely agree with you. Um, that you are perfect as you are, Fabi, as you say, that acceptance is key. That is very important. So. Moving right along, in the South African context, as you might be aware, June is set aside to honor the youth of yesteryears who fought fearlessly for the liberation of this country. The director of the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, Professor Linda Gale Becker, and the adolescent program are commemorating the Youth Month by sharing with you a new web-based research kit. So please watch and listen to the video clip. Well, hello everyone. My name is Linda Gale Becker from the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the launch of the Adolescents in Research Toolkit website. We've been doing this in partnership with Fogarty Ahisa Program, IRV, and many other wonderful partners. We're excited to be launching this website during Youth Month to mark our commitment to the development of young and emerging researchers who have an intention and an interest in adolescent-focused health research. So what is this website about? It is an online, comprehensive, clinical, logistical, ethico-legal resource to facilitate the safe and effective involvement of adolescents in implementation of health and other related research in Sub-Saharan Africa. Who should use it? Well, anyone working with adolescents in research or implementing adolescent research, regardless of experience in research or where you are on the journey of researching adolescents will benefit from this toolkit. How should it be used? Well, we've designed the website to be like a route map that presents a logical process of conducting research with adolescents and how to involve them, their parents, guardians, and other community stakeholders. As the researcher or healthcare provider, you can browse the route map and select the stations or substations that are most relevant to your research journey at the time. Perhaps you just have a simple question, you'll be able to go to one single station and get that question answered. There are additional resources that are hyperlinked 
to make it easy for you to access additional information and still navigate back to the website and the journey wherever you are. For example, let me show you. You may want to go to this part uh, of the website and see what's available there. On the other hand, you may want to go to another part uh, of the journey such as this. If you are working with young key populations, you are not left out. And indeed, there is much to learn about this subject too. You can click on Young Key Population Substation and get all the information you need. You'll find that this website is still a work in progress, and we really value your feedback, your critical consideration, and any good ideas you might have. If you have any comments you'd like to share with us, please feel welcome to contact us at the email address that you'll find at the bottom of this page. We hope you'll have many happy journeys and we look forward to partnering you and making sure that adolescents benefit through our research and are able to participate in our research so that we make it a healthier, better world for them. Thank you very much, Professor Becker. This is quite exciting. From my side, coming from University of Pretoria, we look forward also to trying it out with our adolescents who are in the different communities so that we can see um, some of the, as you say, it is a work in progress as to its user friendliness, some of the information that our young people would be able to gain from that. But I think it is a timely resource at the moment, also considering the rates of obesity as they increase even under COVID um, challenges that we've had. Thank you very much. Moving forward, we are almost at that uh, space where you will be able to ask questions. So we're moving straight into our panel discussion. Allow me to introduce our two panelists, Ms. Monica Zacharias, who is an epidemiologist and biostatistician with over 10 years experience in HIV research, health system strengthening and project management. And also Ms. Preeti Mystery, who is a researcher at the Health Economics and Epidemiology Research Office. So over to you, I don't know if Ms. Monica, you would like to to go first and, and give some of your comments based on what has been discussed so far. Okay, thank you so much, Heather. Um, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I was very impressed by um, all the presentations given and um, especially to point out, like looking at features of the belt and the food environment, because um, often we take for granted that um, physical activity and food choice, to put it that way, is a choice when it's actually shaped by so many other factors that an individual does not necessarily have control over. For example, you may live in an area that's not conducive to physical activity, so it's not safe to actually even walk, like walk around, like in the areas where um, I did a lot of my research, like Kailicha and Guguletu and Mitchell's Plain, it's actually not safe to actually be outside walking in the environment or there are no sidewalks that actually enable you to walk. So I think that's also just very important to point out. Um, and then secondly, also in terms of policy and guidelines, um, we have some evidence from the West that things like a sugar tax works, for example, like we have evidence from Mexico, a lot of South American countries that have shown that reducing sugar in beverages actually has an impact on um, obesity and non-communicable disease risk. Um, but I think it comes down to um, getting different sectors to work together. Um, so getting the food like sector on board, some companies like Coca-Cola, for example, which has like detrimental, has been shown to have like, some countries it's cheaper to buy a Coke than to buy water. So it's that multi-sectoral engagement that's actually important. And so we shouldn't leave it to the health sector per se um, to be the one actually implementing these things. It needs to start from like from co-designing interventions together 
uh, as different sectors. Um, yeah, so those are my comments for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is definitely interesting that um, we have also a population that I think attaches price or monetary value to calories, because if you were to buy water, for example, the fact that it does, if that is unflavored water, the fact that it doesn't have any calories, it seems like it's definitely a waste of money whereas it is more about health. So thank you very much for your comments. Before we go to Ms. Preeti, if I can just ask Poncho, I think it's Pancho. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly because I know you've had your hand up for a while. Would you like to come in and ask your question or comment? Pancho, if you can maybe unmute your mic. Was it Pancho? Okay. All right. To our audience, if you have any question, you are welcome. You are welcome to raise your hand, unmute your mic, and ask. But I'll hand over to Ms. Preeti, Mystery, for your comments. Thanks very much, Dr. Lakodi. <clears throat> I'd, I'd just like to take a moment to try and think back to when I was an adolescent and the, and the complex forces at play and, and contextualize that within the, the talks that we've had from Prof. Barker, from Prof. Pierre and Dr. Adam. And we, we've heard from Prof. Barker about um, the food environment and food choices and um, some of the, the, the evidence around um, Excuse me a minute. Sorry about that. Um, some of the evidence around transition. Um, and thinking about when I was an adolescent and the forces at play and how things have changed. There is so much more information um, available very quickly. Um, uh, speaking to Prof Barker's presentation about um, the general and nutrition knowledge that is so much increased. Um, that there are social and economic transitions that impact the influences that adolescents have um, in terms of the decisions that they make. And then also the change of dynamics of parenthood. And um, Dr. Lahodi mentioned earlier about having a 20 year old daughter and there might be some challenges in terms of what those power balances look like between um, an adolescent and caregiver. And all of this given within the, the context of this changing transitioning environment, um, which uh, Professor Pierre, you brought home to us in South Africa, demonstrating how our, our environments have transitioned to decrease physical activity and increase unhealthy food choices in adolescents. And, um, and then Dr. Adam speaking about the policy interventions that have happened um, great policies that are in place, but really some really important implementation challenges. So I, I guess my questions or comments are around trying to think about the interventions that are going to be effective to um, improve health behaviors and improve them not only in, in the adolescent phase, but sustainable over time. And, and what does that mean in terms of the how to um, build interventions or design interventions that allow for um, more effective um, implementation of policies, but also as Prof Barker um, was mentioning, um, at an individual level with adolescents to build competency and autonomy, and that uh, taking into account the social context that adolescents face. How do we then, um, get adolescents to commit to change and to, to prioritize a, a longer term outcome than one that is immediate? Um, how do we get them to, to build or, or subscribe to commit to habit um, and changes where they are so influenced by social norms and peers? And then also just what is the role of schools um, in, in designing interventions? Um, and what are the role, roles of parents in designing these interventions? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, 
um, Preeti, for those questions. I think these are questions that we definitely need. We need to be thinking about. We need to answer it. It shows that this is a multi-sectoral, I think also multidisciplinary challenge that we are facing. It is important that we focus on the person that we are dealing with, you know, the self-image, that self-respect, even as our artist mentioned, but also even as um, Dr. Baker mentioned, that it is important that we focus on that self-efficacy. And thank you so much for summarizing um, majority of everything, majority of what has been said, focusing on the environment, the sugar tax that we have, there's funding that we need to, to focus on, but also the fact that majority of females are the ones who are affected by this. And we know with females, we have high rates of rape, high rates of um, females being killed. So when you think of security, if we're going to promote them being physically active and knowing that they are safe out there, the cost of physical activity, I mean, if you think of it in, South, in the South African setting, it means somebody must have a gym membership because the environment, me coming from the township, the environment does not necessarily promote physical activity because of issues of safety. And, and also with a study that I did in my PhD in Soweto, safety is an issue. So, okay, um, Prof. Baka, over Hi. to you. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I couldn't see how to raise my hand. I don't know why. Um, yeah, I just, I've been listening to everybody's um, presentations and I'm, I'm, I think we're all grappling with the same issue, which is that we want, we can see that there's a need to move forward and uh, both on a policy front but also on a maybe a smaller scale in implementation or intervention front and how do we really engage young people in, in th thinking forward about health and how do we uh, counter the impacts of the obesogenic environment and I think there are of course lots and lots of uh, simultaneous interventions that we we need to make and could make but fundamentally I think what we as, as um, I guess researchers and, and, and change makers want or should should be doing is to make whatever we're doing more relevant to young people so we'll, young people will engage with a debate which is relevant to them and we know that from the international engagement of young people in climate change, for example. So if they see something as being important, they will engage and they will be phenomenally active and incredibly professional and um, uh, effective in their, in their engagement. And I think maybe we're just missing a trick in health because we're so hung up about health. I think if you, if you sit down with a, a group of young people and you ask them, what in the world, what in your life is important to you? what questions do you have that you want answered, then, then we can start making a, to building an agenda which is more relevant and therefore more engaging for young people and therefore like, more likely to create change. So whereas we come in and we say obesity is a huge problem, it's killing lots of people, it's creating huge uh, a, an avalanche of NCDs, therefore we need to do something about obesity. If we flip that and we said to young people, what are the important issues for you? How can you know, how can we support you to, to answer your questions and to advance your own agendas, then it may be that actually, as a, almost as a byproduct, we will then improve health because we will have more engaged young people. But putting health at the top of the agenda, where it's really not at the top of the young people's agenda most of the time, is, is possibly a mistake that we as adults and we as people engaged in health make all the time. And I think I think it wouldn't be too difficult for us to flip that and to actually start where young people are at and start by making things more relevant to young people by just asking them what they really care about and what they would like to change. Thank you very much, Prof. And I think your comment goes to majority of the solutions that are introduced, even in countries where people are not engaged in addressing their own problems. So people come in and they already want to tell them this is the problem that you have. But it is important that you get that buy-in from young people. I mean, it, it might be that 
their their consent is health but it doesn't just come out as health it's it's more about the self image you know i am concerned about um, my relationship with my friends and so on but i think the health issue might come in and and as i said talking as a mother i'm also realizing as you engage with this young person about the issues and whether it's about friends that they that they are grappling with health at some point is there you know and it's not just about obesity it's about their mental health their yeah. social health and then ultimately it comes into okay their physical health you can encourage them to go for a walk but if they are concerned about uh, security definitely health is not top of their of, of of their agenda so i do agree with you that we need to it, it takes a while but i think if we really care about the health of young people we need to go to their level and say what is important to you and also it is important i think it's important to talk about the role of 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 families you know because this is not a problem that young people are facing on their own these are young people who have families who have friends who have the school environment who have the government these are young people who are not able to find jobs for example in south africa and you can imagine if you are discouraged because of that you are going to school but you are not sure about your job security or what's going to happen to you in the future maybe if that is addressed health also comes in there as as um as a point that needs to be looked into thank you very much any other comments even if it's from our speakers or other participants um your comments are, are really valuable you may un unmute your mic um all right mm -hmm. i see jackie's comment that good point dr baka I think we need to create awareness among the youth to understand the simple BMI. Most youth do not know what it is and compare themselves to others in their communities. So I'm quite shocked when finding out what a healthy BMI is. You are right. And I think studying early about BMIs is, is, is also important because you can imagine if you only find out the importance of a BM or what BMI means and you're already overweight. So bringing that into life orientation lessons also in in the South African context that if teachers are empowered to educate on BMI on monitoring weight even our health facilities we are finding in some cases our health facilities are not friendly to young people and that is something that we also need to look at whether they go there because they are pregnant or they want contraceptives so you can imagine if the the health environment is not friendly who it means for young people health might not be top of their list considering the health facilities are not friendly okay so thank you very much for for all the comments for for all the presentations as well um please note that we will have before you exit we're not about to exit yet but there will be another poll at the end if you can please uh, respond in assessing or uh, giving feedback about this presentation thank you to our speakers i think the information is very valuable hopefully we are moving forward in this discussion about adolescents um, ncds and adolescents obesity and overweight Okay, there is another comment from Zuki Swa. She says, I am just thinking that there's a need to make physical activity to be seen as cool. Yes, and promoting togetherness, keeping them close to their friends. These include sponsoring cycling groups, finding spaces to make this cool. This is, in essence, can also increase more youngsters involved in professional cycling. which will come as a byproduct yeah that is that is a good one also considering the settings you know in some settings cycling might not necessarily be practical but in the research that i did in uh, in mbumalanga for example getting involved with young people around traditional songs or traditional um activities which are more cultural cultural activities that have physical activity 
is also a good one to, to go for in order to promote physical activity. All right, Monica, your hand is up. Um, if you can. Yeah, I just had a, a comment on, on the BMI. Um, so for example, I did my research um, working with teenagers that were living with HIV who are in contact with health services on a regular basis every three months or so. Um, but what I found was that um, even BMI wasn't monitored like following on from after the first screening visit to start them on ART. So after that, it was kind of just never captured again. I'm, I'm assuming if it wasn't captured, it wasn't measured. Um, but then I'd, I'd propose that um, something as simple as a waist circumference, just using a tape measure is also like a good indicator of abdominal obesity. So maybe if a nurse feels that, oh, I don't have time to do this all the time, she could actually just ask them to measure each other with their peers in the clinic because they come in a youth club type of setup. Um, yeah, so that was one comment. Um, and then I was also thinking around, um, what was it now? <laughs> I think I lost my train of thought. But yes, so um, carrying on from um, Mary's comment around the youth telling us what they need. Because sometimes um, if we look at things like youth unemployment, food security, um, these are real issues that might be more pertinent to them, but actually have such a knock-on effect on health and are actually social determinants of health. Um, so if you're finding that maybe 44% of youth actually are multidimensionally poor, these are like, it, it's, it's so many issues around it. So it's like the living environment, it's like the parental involvement, it's all these other social things that have a knock-on effect um, so I, I'm just thinking of the role of actually participatory research in around framing what they see as being important or what they view as being the most pertinent issue to them at this point in time. Um, and then actually then working together with them to design like interventions. Yeah, so just my two comments. Okay. Thank you for that comment. I'm also just thinking, is health attractive? You know, I find young people think health is boring because health professionals are boring. You know, if we can just acknowledge that. When you compare to messages from different artists, from those who sell unhealthy foods, for example, where when we talk about health, it's more text. You know, it's more things in writing and it is not made to be attractive. Um, and I was thinking of this website that, that um, the Desmond Dudu Foundation is launching, that it is important, as you said, it is a work in progress. It is important that it, as it grows, it is a platform that is exciting for young people. You know, maybe there's games that can be associated with it where they can come into this space and be able to play some games that are not they have a health um, undertone, if I may put it that way, so that health is not necessarily put um, straight in their faces. I think maybe the way that we are communicating health makes it a little bit scary for them. I don't know. But I find health messages are boring. When people talk, maybe when they talk condoms, it's a bit exciting. But when you see these health messages, even on billboards, you just think if I was a young person, I would just think I'm not going to be, I'm not concerned about health at the moment. So we need to change how we communicate. We need to find a way to talk to young people by talking about what is important to them. I know in the South African context at the moment, we have issues of unemployment. I don't think you can talk about unemployment and at some point not get to health. We definitely can get to that. Um, and in our family settings, you know, I think change starts, they say start change with where you are. That's why I'm talking more as a mom, because I find at times we do things as professionals. And when you come to doing it as a mother, it just, you can see that this is not attractive to my kids. I have found when I talk to my children about health, uh, guys, if you don't have your breakfast, you're not going to school. I was just so, I don't know if it is pragmatic, just being, this is what you must do. This is what you're not going to do. And unfortunately, I think it left a bitter taste in their mouths. Until now, they are coming around and it is as they define it, you know, as health is important to them. So our way of communicating as parents as health professionals, I think is important. We need to also 
put them in the center and understand that this is their world and we need to find out how do we get into their world? How do we learn even the language that they are using? Because maybe the way that we are doing it is more, is more boring. All right, Yvonne says, oh, Zani says 100% agreed. Mary says, it's, yeah, to us old people too. Yeah, until you, you are at risk of, of being sick or now you have, you have a medical condition, then you start reading up about health. Yvonne says, I agree, not as catchy as those that offer non-healthy options. Yeah, and I think we really need to change. I don't know, change is not easy because we are trained as professionals, whether it is over a period of 10 years, and then now you must make something exciting, which was never really exciting to you. And we're, we're talking about these big terms. But I wish we can go into young people's uh, spaces, and, and engage more with them rather than talking about health. And then from there, come and talk about health. That's why I enjoy community nutrition because we teach students, go into the community, immerse yourself, learn from them what they eat without you telling them what they need to eat. And then from there, you can start doing the education. All right, um, that's exactly what I wanted to say, Prof. Mary says. Celia says it is important to bear in mind that there's a huge wave of fit in fit fluencers who are super attractive. Yes, young people, young women who attract sponsorship from big corporations. You see, so that to me says young people are more interested in beauty. You know, they want to influence others. They are not interested in health, but health can be something that they address as a secondary objective. So I hope one thing that we can take from this webinar is let's go out there, not as specialists, not as uh, professionals, but let's go out there as members of communities. Yes, we have the information, but let's immerse ourselves in the lives and in the, the spaces of our young people, the different settings that they are in and learn from them. And then from there, we can talk about health and make it important. Audrey says, peer-based models of engagement with the adolescents do make a difference to bring change to this age group. Yes, so your peer-based models of engagement. Audrey, do you want to, to comment a little bit more around that one? Are you talking more about where young people get uh, participate with their friends? <laughs> Monica is laughing. Okay. Once you start laughing, I love laughing. So I just laugh. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it makes you relax a little bit. Okay. Oh, um, okay. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Hida. Uh, yes, I was just talking about uh, peer-based uh, peer uh, models for adolescents, whereby uh, some adolescents can actually be trained in uh, bringing change especially in the in uh, programs that can that are related to dietary uh, changes so when the adolescents are involved themselves some adolescents young adolescents are trained and then uh, they involve their other adolescents then uh, we are bound to see some change uh, uh, from the team that will have been engaged uh, by the adolescents Oh, that sounds interesting. Thank you for sharing that one, Audrey. And also, I think, colleagues, it's important to realize that our young people are stressed. I mean, we have rates of suicides, for example, depression going up. So I can imagine as a young person, if you now bring it to my plate, that if I don't lose weight, I'm going to die all of non-communicable diseases. I mean, you're, you're adding to my stress honestly. So I think the way that we bring the topic up is important. Um, addressing what is important to them, and then we'll address the rest later. But thank you, Audrey, for sharing that one. And, and hopefully going out, we'll go into their spaces. I find the spaces of young people are actually very interesting. My kids say, mom, you are so, everything for you is a lesson. And maybe it's the academia in me or the, the academic in me that they just want you to relax, you know, empower them to make their own decisions, but don't decide for them what's going to be on their plate, because otherwise they just kick. They don't want to hear it. OK. Um, 
Oops, I just want to see that comment in full. I'm sorry. Oh, do you think young people want us to go into their spaces? You, I think they don't want us to go into their spaces. I think it depends on our attitude, Prof. If our attitude is that of what are you doing? Um, and we are more inquisitive. No, they don't want us in their spaces. But if our attitude is that of, I want to learn, you know, then they are more welcoming because we are saying, we don't know everything. There's so much that you guys can teach us. I'm learning that from my kids. I learn so much from them. So if they can teach me some of the things they read from Twitter, they read from all these social um social networks and they're able to teach me then we have a discussion it's not i'm not above them as a mother and i'm not above them as somebody with a phd but we are able to have a discussion at their level i think if we go in with that attitude of saying i want to learn and not being judgmental i have found that young people are approachable so i think it's it's definitely the manner of approach Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. I don't know if that um, the poll, that question has been flighted yet at the end, but if you can please answer that, I would like to thank and appreciate our panelists, our artist, DTHF, and our sponsor, IAVI, for sponsoring this event. Very fruitful discussions. So before you exit the Zoom platform, please um, do that evaluation with us. Thank you so much for taking part and taking a moment to complete that survey. So even as I speak, I hope you are completing it. Your feedback will help us to improve the webinar series, series um, going forward. So also note, be aware that the session has been recorded and it will be available for you to view on the DTHF's um, YouTube channel. Um, yeah, the question from Nogwanda, thank you. When we, are we having another one? Peer-based models, okay. The evaluation form should appear on a web page when this webinar ends. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's anything from your side, um, from our host. Or can we end? Thank you. This? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Um, we can end um, the workshop, the, the webinar. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.